I mean, I have just listened to Dr. Tara Swart Bieber. She's a stress doctor, and she said uh, there's something now um, uh, called neuroesthetics. Now, neuroesthetics is where you spend once a week uh, with something that is of creative nature, whether that's walking in the park, painting a picture, doing craft creating something, singing, humming. You know, our ancestors have been humming. You know, they would maybe go and hunt and gather. And once they, they were finished hunting and gathering, they would be sat around the fire and chill and dance and hum, you know. Dancing is art, you know, whether that's dancing or whatever it is. It, I think everyone needs that. Hey, welcome back to Soul Awakenings with Madhya Sosan podcast. Today we have Yasmin Gravitas. Yasmin is a trained British TV and movie actor of German and Turkish descent. She was recently cast on an American TV series called FBI International, where she guest starred as Officer Pasha. She speaks several languages and enjoys a good cup of coffee in her free time. Let's bring her on. Hi, Jasmine. How are you doing? I'm all right. How are you doing, Madea? Oh, I'm doing great. Fantastic. So we actually met a couple of weeks ago at mm-hmm. a place called Active Wellness Cafe and Center. Yes. And uh, we got talking and I found out you have amazing journey to share. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to bring you on my podcast and see where mm-hmm. this goes. Mm-hmm. I know who you are. Our audiences don't know who you are. Can you tell us a bit about yourself, a brief overview of who Yasmin is? Sure, sure. Um, I'm a humble but ambitious, um, hardworking um, female individual who fetishizes her work. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, and so my name is um, Yasmin uh, or Yasmin. Um, it's it's the Turkish spelling. Um, it's a quite an international name. Um, it it's obviously stands for the flower, the scent, the flower. Um, I try to pre- uh, represent my name as much as I can, although I don't always succeed. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and um, I'm happy to share my journey with you. So. I don't know where you would like me to start, to be honest. Yeah, well, how about you start off with how was your childhood? Like, what was your environment like? What were you like as a child? Let's start off, let's start off yeah. with that. Oh. So I had, um, I must say, I, I was raised bilingually and biculturally as well. I was born in Germany um, to a Turkish-speaking environment. So I've had Turkish and German cultural influxes and cultural cultural references and um two languages to learn at the same time so um it was um quite full on so there was um um i think um i felt at times lost but at times i felt zen within myself so i've always felt that i had two personalities and now i'm trilingual i have three personalities maybe even more because i'm an actress mm-hmm. but um the the upbringing was um um yeah it was quite challenging because um in school obviously i had to switch to german mentality and speaking to people it was like okay it's the german sound now and then you know when i spoke to my mom it was like oh now turkish and i spoke german to my brother so back to german i think um i've learned with time that i was probably impatient and i wanted to learn everything fast um, so i was quite slow in school to start with um mm. but i was a very playful very you know charming very you know warm always you know always enjoyed so- social activities and uh, sharing toys with people and um 
I always had a big heart. I I do know that. But I also was confused in myself. Mm. Why were you confused? Because I felt, um, where do I belong? I mean, I feel a bit lost in this world. Because in Germany, I looked way too Turkish. And in in whenever I went on holiday to Turkey, I was clearly too too German or too mm. European or too modern. Mm. Um and, and that was a very confusing place to be at times, to always having to be these two individuals in one person. Mm. Did you have any like um issues with racism kind of thing or Yes. Um, yeah. So there is a there is a um, actually a German slur for people from German speaking countries who um, with roots from the Middle East, particularly Turkey, and um, <laughs> the word is Kanake. Mm-hmm. So it's spelled K A N A K E, and it's a uh, yes. It's quite derogatory. Um, it's it's like the N word, maybe not exactly like the N word, but it has a similar connotation. Let's call it that way, yeah. And it was um, a bit, yeah. I, I felt ostracized at times because, like, I speak quite high level German, or you know, it's my my first language. My first mother tongue is German. My second is Turkish, and my third is English, and. Um, yeah, because the way I look, I don't particularly belong to the stereotype um, German look. I've always felt a bit like an underdog or outsider, and I was called names. Mm. Um, and that was quite tough to get used to. And, and it became kind of normalized. Yeah. Um, yes. Usually is the case, isn't it? Like when you're different from the society and you're... It's like we work, we we're, we work in herds, like tribes. And if you're different from the tribe, and then they consciously, like they can't adjust to you being a little bit different. Mm. Um, even though society need to adjust to you as well, right? At the same yes. time, right? Yes. Um, so you talked quite uh, a bit about your cultural cultural uh, challenges. Um, was there any point your family faced that as well at the same time? Yeah, I mean, um, I also want to add um, something else to what I said earlier about being ostracized. I also felt the racism in Turkey whenever I went over there. I just never felt that I fitted in, Mm -hmm. um, that I was not Turkish enough, you know, as a German Turk, because that's the term that was used for people who have, you know, come over in the 1950s. So there's like... After the war um, in uh, Germany, um, Tur- um, Germany was rebuilt. Had to be, was completely demolished, as you can imagine, after the Second World War. And in between fifty fifty and nineteen seventy three, I believe, or nineteen fifty five till seventy two, to be precise, um, um, Germany um, got cheap labor from turkey so that's how the turkish communities have settled in germany so it was my grandparents who came over from turkey to germany to work in germany in the factories to help rebuild germany and in construction and steel industry and all of that so um so that was the first generation of Turkish people settling in Germany and there was a phrase called guest worker or gastarbeiter and that just it was meant to be a contract for five years and then send send those people back home but what happened was people did stay in Germany and decided to bring their families over and their eventually their kids and and but it was a very rigid process um my grandparents were lucky enough to be chosen you had to have you know nice teeth nice you know healthy kind of way of being um a straight spine you know like they even checked if if you're you know if you had rotten te- teeth 
for really? instance. Wow. Yes. And nice. if <laughs> I do know some, I do know someone, um, father who was sent back home because he was just not, um, perfect enough to work um in 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 the german factory so it was not just just anyone it had to be someone of a certain caliber to be able to make it so that already shows like that is also passed on to me i believe that kind of not um the you know the hard working uh, kind of um a nature of people so like my grandparents were hardworking my parents were hardworking being an immigrant child just 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 I I became the same kind of I have the same outlook still about life I just work hard and hope that it's it's enough to succeed yeah that. and uh, yeah yeah it it does make sense so you kind of, kind of carrying that generational stuff from mm -hmm. your grandparents and your parents mm -hmm. and you know, sometimes you're the one who has to break it right so, so there's <laughs> something needs to be like okay this is the pattern <laughs> it needs yeah. to be something different right exactly. and I, I totally get the like you know I, I've I've come from Pakistan and I totally get okay. the yeah mm -hmm. so I was born in Pakistan I moved here when I was seven and it's just you find like you like a lost soul in a way in this world is like where am I what what it's like I'm here okay this is my home but you're mm -hmm. actually getting pulled towards your your original home and then it's like really really weird combination mm -hmm. it's, it's hard adjusting into that environment as well you know when I first moved here I didn't speak any English um, yeah, sure. and that meant I had no friends either so how was how was your friendships like you know um, through those challenges well, um, so I I um, arrived in the UK. I mean, would you like me to talk about my yeah. friendships in Germany or when I arrived in the UK? Because that was a new beginning for me as well. A bit not as maybe as similar as yours, because I came as an adult. I came as an exchange student um, and then I decided not to exchange. <laughs> 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 yeah let's talk about the UK because obviously we, we kind of have a similar journey yeah so yeah I I kind of arrived two decades ago um and I was studying and I did want to do um, a semester in the UK um which means six months and I came you know with a backpack just intending to stay to stay six months and then I ended up um yeah say staying 20 years and I'm happy to to be here and again it was a you know a new environment I spoke very little English I mean I had a very good you know kind of German schooling and um a very good foundation and amazing grammar um, but <laughs> when it came to speaking, it was like I was really struggling because I thought people are not going to be patient. They're going to hate my accent. Um, I sounded quite German, you know, in my accent. I've lost that now through, you know, intentional training. And <laughs> 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 listening and mimicking, you know. <laughs> um but yeah it was it was quite tough I I have to say but again I tried to fit in and find find me you know in a, again in a different country um and it was um the friendships the, to, to come back to your question the friendships that I have created I've always tried to have like deep and meaningful friendships um and um I just don't like superficialness I but in the beginning I had to just talk to people so I was trying to be fearless and just practice my English and talk and make friends and you know and I I was always drawn to people who had also multiple cultures or you know if they had traveled um, a lot as well like I did um, so I've kind of like trying to find common things um, 
or people of sporty nature, you know, because I have, again, this, this, um, in, back in Germany, I have, I was quite exposed to sports as well. And I always wanted to be the best, the, the, the perfect nation, you know, um, I was into swimming, into basketball and into diving and all of that, just to prove to the Germans that I can be just as good as they are, you know, that was always within me. So kind of that competitiveness and, so yeah, those kind of things. Yeah, so it's <laughs> like you... a long-winded answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, uh, it's like it's like because you said you wanted to prove to the Germans, but mm-hmm. I think on your journey you kind of find out that you're you, it's you need you need to prove to yourself, right, right, right? absolutely, <laughs> because it's like it's almost like we saw. Uh, buried in in our external world and we saw buried in like how we want to fit into the world Mm. and we want the world to accept us or partner to accept us or a boss to accept us Mm. but we will carry on attracting those kind of experiences because we haven't found that acceptance in ourselves. yes and we are seeking external validation and approval because you know why, Medea, I think, in my humble opinion, it is the conditioning mm-hmm. imposed on us by parents, by teachers, by generally by people, by the environment. There's so many influences. And I think um, it's it's now down to us to decondition from the conditioning. Mm-hmm. I wanted to ask you about this conditioning and deconditioning since we've mm-hmm. touched upon it now let's talk about it now what, okay. what were your thoughts on it I think my thoughts on it is that um we you know we come we come here on this we are here in this 3d virtual world right and you have we have this great gift it's it's magical in my opinion um however then you know like this there is sorry there is no however um and and we are you know we are born we are playful we are this like empty vessel um this beautiful nature this authentic self um that we all are and have within us and then something happens when we um get the conditioning from uh, our caregivers mainly you know whoever they are and then it's these kind of inhibitions start in life and these restrictions and these rules and you know and all of a sudden we are in- inhibited i guess and in my opinion we are born to create and we have to find that again in ourselves, in, in our soul searching or soul finding journeys. Um, everyone is unique and everyone has their own path. And I I I haven't arrived yet, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm enjoying the journey. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what where are you supposed to arrive anyway? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So many of us get caught up in a destination. It's like, what do you mean? Like, what destination? <laughs> it's what like it? internal. Like you, it's like it's mm-hmm. uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. We're 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 gonna keep coming back to this. It's like it's never ending journey. <laughs> Absolutely, and it should be never ending because because you know there is also you know i'm also um a nerd about neuroscience i absolutely adore neuroscience and the reason for that is i do want to know what goes on what goes on in my brain how my brain is laid out and and um what happens when i have a dopamine rush what happens when i have an oxytocin um overload what happens when i increase my serotonin levels what happens when i have increased endorphins and i know now roughly how to balance them Mm. (laughs) oh well well we'll get into a bit more about the um that but i wanted to ask you about your near-death experiences so you (laughs) had two near-death experiences what happened Yes, the first one um, 
was in uh, Nepal. Yeah. Um, I I'm a bit of a extremist um, when it comes to sports. Mm-hmm. Um, I just want to try everything. So um, I was I was kind of trekking in Nepal. Um, I have chosen to do an eight day Annapurna mountain trek. Um, um, while I was out in Kathmandu um, to attend a wedding, and I added another two weeks to the wedding. Um, so I've had three weeks in Nepal. Um, I hadn't planned anything, but while I was out there, I was kind of looking into, you know, going to Pokhara and, and taking the journey, either Mount Everest or Annapurna. So I decided to do Annapurna. And then I found a mountain guide who was able to, um, to um, come along with me um, on this journey along. Also his son came along with, as well. So it was a group of three, like three of us. Um, because alone, I think that would have been a bit of a stupid thing to do, you know, completely facing mm-hmm. the mountains myself. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. I, I would get completely yeah. lost anyway. So yeah. it was um, so when the mountain guide said, well, have you trekked in your in your life before? And I said, no, but I ran the marathon and he, he was so like, not the same thing. <laughs> It's a bit of a difference, you know, <laughs> thing to do. <laughs> Not really comparable. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I don't care. I, I've run the marathon. I can do the Annapurna Mountain. <laughs> <laughs> he could see the drive. He, can, he could see the determination in me. And he just took me on and, and he said, right, okay, I'll make, I'll, I'll prepare a, um, a journey, which me uh, you know which will mean we are gonna go gradually up um and um so he he's prepared me prepared me not like on the way we started walking basically we just started walking and he said all right what we are going to go you know up to 1500 meters do today so that was day one um i didn't know what it involved I just knew I had legs to walk I knew I was kind of fit I had the stamina but I didn't know what to expect so I think it was on day four when I got really ill and I had food poisoning and I had major altitude sickness and it was really getting to a stage where I was you know almost about to break down it was so bad um I'm laughing about it because I had I was vomiting and I had diarrhea at the same time. <laughs> All right, and you're laughing. And, <laughs> and I couldn't drink the water that they were drinking. So it was just really like a bad situation to be in and and I had to just go and take a shit where I could and you know just use the field and um yeah, and when we got to 4,500 meters, I think, I just literally said, I think I'm going, I I, I just felt like dying. I, I, I couldn't cope anymore. Um, so I was sleeping on this, in, 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 on, on this concrete, which was in a mountain house, which is usually um, where, you know, we were sleeping. So there was no bed. It's like three layers that I had with me, uh, like a sleeping bag and then two more. And it in on, during the day, it would be 15 degrees. And during the night, it would go down to minus 15. So handling the temperature change as well. And I would, just went into like jerking and shivering. And I, I just didn't know whether I was going to make the night. And it was just fighting with death it was it's you know life and death is such a thin line Mm. and I feel that I was tapping into death and out of it during the night it was so difficult I was in and out in and out and I I was just praying and I was meditating that's where the meditation came into place um and I survived the night it was the most difficult one of the most difficult nights of my life it was a survival uh, night Mm -hmm. 
and I um yes I um I you know I saw white screen and black screen and stars and all sorts of like I don't know transformational experiences um that were really painful physically and mentally and emotionally um but then um when I survived and I couldn't walk anymore I was literally um really on my knees I didn't know what to do and um I just crawled I started crawling down and I I managed to inform my guide who was staying in another mountain house that I'm ill and I passed him my phone and um I said can you please um ring my mom if I die you know that was the last thing I said and then I yes I survived eventually luckily I'm still here um but it was he's changed the you know we were going to go higher so he's changed he's changed our path to go lower again and we found a house which was occupied by Gurkha fighters um and um they really looked after me um that was my reco- recovery um they there was you know the, the strength of the men in the house and the strength of the women in the house you know it was just um like they were doing a sound bath and they were doing a ceremony and and it was i think it was a it was a pre-wedding ritual what they were doing but they gave me a place to stay so instead of going higher up, they just took us as guests on board. And I ha- I remember having a garlic soup made by them and just sitting with them uh, around the fire. I have just felt like I've just survived the war, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I guess is that, that is that your kind of awakening? It's quite, it sounds quite yeah. spiritual, like you go through, right, uh, almost like to breaking point and yeah. seeing death. And then you're you're confronted by people who are actually sitting around the fire and do sound healing. And it's, yeah. like, it's a perfect spiritual awakening, I would say. And 100%, 100% right? it was, yes. It was so, beautiful. Yeah. So were you spiritual beforehand or was that actually like a light bulb moment where that was the light transform- bulb. transformational? Journey yes. Side. yes 100% I mean I always believed in karma mm-hmm. that's how I was raised and and I always believed you know if if you're evil then s- something will come and bite you eventually and if you're good then I'm not expecting anything good to happen but we we hope right mm, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah some some good vibration good frequency will hopefully then lead you into the right path at least so that was my belief system anyway but I just couldn't put it in a format Mm. um and I guess that moment of fighting with you know for survival was my moment of awakening if Mm. if you like to call that call it that yeah yeah so what changed for you after your awakening um I think my um craving for soul searching has um settled a little bit more I think I became slightly more grounded and I enjoyed you know certain things again like I I used to love um taekwondo so I've you know started boxing it um, and it's not the same but I just like martial arts so it just made me more I guess more grounded and I also <laughs> felt there is more to life than this 3d world and it's 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 the higher powers that help you um and it's um yeah it's there is more than just this momentarily temporarily thing i believe and that is beautiful in itself it's nothing to be scared scared about um when people used to tell me about spiritual wisdom I was always thinking oh that's what is that you know what is one of them sounds sounds like bollocks to me you know like <laughs> yeah. as, so as a kid growing up or people used to say oh go to the church or go to the mosque and I just don't believe in kind of institutional religion it's not for me specifically I uh, each to their own you know everyone you know can practice what they believe in just don't stick it down down my throat so that's kind of my attitude I just like to have no intermediaries 
I just like to believe that this universe is here for us uh, and things happen not to us, but for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, beautifully put. So you're an interpreter, right? Um, as in like in my in my kind of like language, an interpreter. <laughs> so <I was> like, <laughs> Is that how you pronounce yeah. it? <laughs> Interpreter. If I do the uh, mashed with my Urdu and uh, it's Urdu, <laughs> Urdu and English, Interpreter. <laughs> and then I forget. I was like, actually, you need to say in English, Interpreter. <laughs> <laughs> and still, it's a struggle to say it because you're like, no, Interpreter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so where was that so so you you're an interpreter interpreter <laughs> mm -hmm. um you shifted to acting mm -hmm. how did that come about so I'm a trained um and qualified legal court interpreter to be precise but I also have done football interpreting and medical interpreting and business meetings and everyone who needed those kind of services I have stepped in as and when needed and I have realized when I was interpreting I wasn't just interpreting the words um, because like 97 97 of how we communicate is body language and it's only three percent the words so I was I always when I was interpreting I was acting like my client and now I'm acting I'm interpreting the script so it's very interwined mm. um and essentially I'm I'm performing and it is I saw the similarities in it and because I also have a journalistic background, so I'm I have always been a storyteller. Um, I actually won an award when I was 10 years old. Um, I was in a in a TV project which was, you know, which was took off in Germany. Um, so I guess acting was really um there was not a def definite way, but um I found my way in. Uh, and then I decided to train and to learn it from from the master of the master mm, mm, as to amazing. how I can, you know, um, get really good at it. Mm. Because there's just too much competition. And, and I thought, OK, if I go and train as an actor, then at least I can I can have the toolkit that I require to be on set to the best of my skills and, and capabilities. And I broke into acting. So now I'm a working actor uh, who loves screen acting. I trained in classically, um, I'm classically, you know, trained uh, as a theater actor because my mentor uh, has told me that in order to appreciate acting, you have to know both sides of the coin, the theater and then the screen. So if you can, if I can teach you what to do on stage, you'll appreciate screen much more. Mm. So that's how I ended up, you know, being trained by Simon Trender at ICAD in Manchester for two years. Um, and then I got signed in London uh, by an agent and then I started acting professionally. Oh, so amazing! I, so yeah. you, oh, I, 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 so you've been on uh, FBI Inter International, uh, Emmerdale, Coronation Street, House of Fools, and the list goes on. So, how did that experience come about? How was that experience? Um, I was nervously excited. <laughs> yeah, you would be. Because FBI International is American TV show, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So you yeah. flew into America to do do the. Um, it was shot in Hungary. For, um, uh, oh, so really? yeah, so it was. I flew out to Hungary to Budapest, which was a beautiful um location, 
Um, so yeah, it was a um, it's it's it was a tough process to get in, and it's uh, you have to be the best, but also you are also the script has to be right as well for you. You know, it's there is on, only so much. I can do um, from my end, you know, in terms of the character and how I play the character, then it's down to the casting director to like it and then to the director to like it, then to the producers to like it and then to the ex ex executive producers to authorize the whole project. So it's there's like such a rigid, um, um, challenging or complicated for some people process that goes into um you know being on set um and um being chosen um but like i said there's i'm a hard working individual i use the toolkit that i was um trained in and um yeah it was it was a fantastic experience it was marvelous i i don't know what to say but i really enjoyed every minute i I worked with a fantastic director who was, who, you know, um, was able to give me great directions that I took on board because as an actor, you have to be malleable. You might have an idea as to how you want to play the character, but one, until you get on set and your makeup is done and your uniform or your costume is given to you, I, I feel it then more. And then mm. I kind of start using my physicality as well so what how does the character walk how does she talk and all of that I got trained in so we did Laban which is like you know different um styles movements so like I've looked into that um how do I talk like do I use what kind of pitch is is she talking you know it's not just the lines it's the it's the subtext that is nice to watch it's what I do between my lines you know when you know that's more powerful than anything else so yeah it was a, it was a great experience oh, and amazing. I, I'm in series two episode four if anyone is watching FBI International <laughs> oh, yeah go, go have a look I'll, I'll go and have a look now as well <laughs> well after this interview of course <laughs> well, thank you <laughs> Um, so you mentioned toolkit mm -hmm. twice now. So what is your survival toolkit? All right. Um, yes. Um, so there is like, I've got, a, imagine I've got a bag and like a magic bag. And there is like, I put my hand in and see which one comes out. <laughs> I just like use, use a variety of toolkits. So if I feel um i'm struggling with let's say fear i use tony robbins style so i've i, I believe you have been to one of his workshops as well unleash the power within so i i loved it i love this man's energy yeah. it's just incredible um, I think it's using the power within. Um, so it helped me. Tony Robbins has helped me to become a fearless actor, and um, and he, you know, he he rippled me. It was a ripple effect, and I used some of his work um, to just stay grounded, stay within, and go in with all I have, the energy um then I have you know like I obviously my acting toolkit is quite specific because every actor uses a different method so that's quite technical so I use actioning and I use Stanislavski and I ask myself what does the character want where does she want to get and how is she going to get there and what is her goal for the scene so I've asked I ask these four questions and I work it out myself and then it's it's all about my scene partner it's all about changing my scene partner so if my goal is to if I have a male scene partner and I want to kick him out of the house my goal is to kick him out hmm. and, and his goal is maybe stay in the house so it's it's that kind of in that conflict that goes on and and what do I use to really kick him out so it's it's 
say it's changing your scene partner it's all about your scene partner it's not about you it's about the scene partner so I use that kind of toolkit for acting but and then I use Gabo Mate's um, style of um, how he has consolidated trauma release and he's explained what happens in the brain and 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 how trauma can manifest in the brain I just remember that for instance you know what I have experienced I had two near-death experiences the second one was just uh, was when I was assaulted brutally and I I woke up from the assault so it's it's that's a traumatic event Mm. now if it stays in your brain it's trauma if you can if, if if it defines you if it over consumes you you and it's it's there all the time it's trauma and it's trauma is very hard because it's a scar in in the brain it's a tissue and it's really hard to overcome so I've watched Wisdom of Trauma by Gabo Mate and it's I think everyone should watch it because he's he's talking about ways to detach and and decompress from um you know from those traumas or traumatic events so that that I find fascinating and I use Andrew Huberman's neuroscientific way of how the brain uh, exists and uh, what's within the brain so that helps me to understand it and I use Joe Dispenza methods um now daily I meditate every day I've just come back from his um meditation retreat so that has really given me another toolkit to work with Mm, so which is do the work he says do the work yeah well you gotta you when you're on this path you gotta you got you can't you can't (laughs) progress without not you you have to it's like you're you'll be in that stuck energy with uh gabor mate so obviously you talked about trauma, right? You know, uh, working on yourself. What sort of things that you've done to work on the trauma that you've experienced? Well, um, hmm. I think I had to help myself first. Um, I mean, I have, I mean, I'm going to mention this briefly, but I have been raised in a in a dysfunctional household you know there was a lot of domestic violence um which became normalized um in the household that I was raised in and I had to just uh, that's just not one event there's like several right um and uh, and to detach from it and to Basically, I went from being a victim to survival to thriving. That is a very kind of, it's a three-step three process, I call it that. And it's its what helped me the most probably was doing the work, um, exercising, talking to competent, uh, trained people um, about your experiences and sharing it and also helping other people who are in need as mm-hmm. and when I can, you know, within reason, you know, within my capabilities. And also with art, with art, I feel um, that I can hopefully reach out to so many people that will appreciate my art and maybe it will be their wake up call. That's that that is the the dream of the script writer, the dream of an actor that to, you know, move the audience with your art. And mm. and I, I have rechanneled my energies through writing. So I'm writing two scripts as well at the moment. So mm. that will something that will be something for the future when it's ready, um, where I, you know, where um, hopefully I can have, a more empowering effect on on people in need um and i'm yes my my area might be females because there's like statistically um they're more they have been more exposed to violence um but it's also the other way around i'm not disregarding males you know yeah. um anyone you know anyone who's been othered you know i i have um 
I have a lot of compassion for, a lot of, uh, you know, love for anyone who's been othered because we have all been othered at some point in our lives. And then uh, it's, it's reconciling it all and it's having the right space to talk about these things, I, I guess. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think it's, it's great that you're using art as well because not many people think about that, right? You know, we go like exercising on the front scene, the therapist or doing our internal family system or like Reiki and that kind of thing. But not yes. many people talk about art, which, you know, it's, it's really important because I interviewed somebody um, in the last series and she talked about the uh, releasing trauma through artwork and, that you know, it can be very beneficial. Yes. I mean, I have just listened to Dr. Tara Swart Bieber. She's a stress doctor. And she said uh, there's something now um, uh, called neuroaesthetics. Now, neuroaesthetics is where you spend once a week uh, with something that is of creative nature, whether that's walking in the park, painting a picture, doing craft, creating something, singing, humming. You know, our ancestors ha have been humming. You know, they would maybe go and hunt and gather. And once they, they were finished hunting and gathering, they would be sat around the fire and chill and dance and hum, you know. Dancing mm -hmm. is art, you know, whether that's dancing or whatever it is. It, I think everyone needs that. And I, I hope everyone will find a day in the week where they can do that, you know. Mm. Um, whatever, you know, everyone is unique. So you just have to find something that you, where you nurture your creativity. Oh, I love amazing. dancing as well, for instance. I couldn't do without dancing. Yeah, amazing. Dancing is also another is like form of moving your body because I always like yes. in my workshops, I always get people to obviously we look into the stuff but then we also uh dance at the end as well to release that out of their body because it's really important because you don't want to be sitting with your stuff or trauma or dwelling on it for that long you just get up and you just shake it out of your body right so that which is why dancing is so sure. important if you combine that it's a balance <laughs> Sure. And, and that I'm glad you mentioned that because apparently one feeling only lasts 90 seconds. Now, the reason for that is because your pain and pleasure circuits are really next to each other in your brain, according to neuroscience. Yeah. So, so if you're like sad or depressed or whatever, or upset or whatever, what you need to do is, in my opinion, put the favorite song on start dancing yeah yeah you get I mean, like 90 90 seconds of process this this stuff like yeah, yeah. cry about it for 90 seconds Boom. <laughs> because you can't have pain and pleasure at the same time no so that's also gabo mate's work when you watch wisdom of trauma like people like talk about it and then he just cracks a joke and then <laughs> they, everyone starts laughing and laughter is also quite infectious um yeah. a bit like dancing you know so it's it's the 90 second rule <laughs> oh beautiful love it I think I've, I've listened to something somewhere they, they were talking about the 90 second as well that we then why do we dwell on it for so long um how do we overcome it and yeah so it's it makes sense it makes sense but some mm -hmm. people do numb it out as well like you know it's like the pain you can't have pain and pleasure but you can have pain but numb the pain and then have the pleasure mm -hmm. right so the numbing comes in and that's where also Gabor Mate is like I've, I've been following him as well and he's amazing at teaching these th 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 type of things because especially autoimmune conditions he talked about right so you know it's like they your nervous your immune system attacking itself that's physical level right and like on an emotional level what are you saying to yourself oh I'm stupid I'm this I'm like uh, people pleasing no no boundaries set yeah. and that kind of manifests into f physical illness which is mind-blowing mind-blowing so sure, yeah i'm sure i mean the mask has to come down at some point where we face reality and the numbing i think is just a survival uh, trying to fit in having a mask you know so we have like a functional shell which 
serves to a so up to a certain level but if the functional shell is your new per is the only persona then it's a very shallow life to lead yeah At some yeah. point the mask has to come down and we have to just be authentic like we were as kids you mm -hmm. know true true that, that's that's <laughs> what you talked about conditioning right so up until yes. then you're environment kicks in your parents kick in and everything else and you get molded and shaped into a person that that's not authentically you mm. yeah completely agree <laughs> so what's next for you what's your vision what's next for me um in terms of my acting career I'm currently actually uh, filming something else um which is shot in Manchester funny enough so yeah, I'm um I'm playing I can tell you about it a little bit because we're still in the process of filming. Um it's an independent film um called Memory Chase and it's um it's about a technician with no recollection of her past uh, who risks her future to chase the memory of her dreams. So hence why it's uh, memory it's called Memory Chase and I play Mary the memory clinician. Mm -hmm. amazing so where where um i'm not where it was like i know it's in manchester but when is it going to be out you know oh i don't know yet possibly I, i'd imagine it would be out hopefully next year um but um i, I can't be sure about uh the release date because we are filming in it in bits so we do mm -hmm. like different scenes on different days um but it's it's yeah it's interesting and it's um it's um yeah I look forward to I'm I'm enjoying the journey so again I'm not looking at the release date I can't I don't even know it <laughs> yeah. I'm just enjoying being in the moment being creative and and collaborating with with the scriptwriter with the director with my scene partners and everything and just everyone is doing their best to pull it together beautiful love it love it i'm <laughs> uh, looking forward to that next year like you know i'll be i'll be right there watching it <laughs> <laughs> oh bless. if it's if it's a cinema release i will certainly let you know oh yeah 100 percent. um so i've got some rapid fire questions for you okay right? and i i kind of grill all of my guests <laughs> towards okay. the end okay. of the interview are you okay. ready okay yeah i am i'm trying okay yeah yeah oh don't worry okay. <laughs> you sound really scared I was a bit... <laughs> oh, it's all good it's all good enjoy the moment enjoy the journey <laughs> of rapid fire questions <laughs> right okay so what is your definition of god life universe um It's a personal relationship with the higher powers that will lead me down a path that will be exciting and sad and happy and optimistic and interesting and magical and lovely and jubbly. <laughs> <laughs> lovely and jubbly. Fantastic. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> what do you think happens when you die? I do not know the answer of that question, my darling. However, I do feel that my soul, well, I do hope that my soul will continue to be alive and that I don't know in what version I may come back. I hope it's not going to be a horrible animal. <laughs> Or horrible human being, but I do believe that there is the soul will continue in one way or the other. I mean, if we do, if we did know the answer, it would be life would be boring. And if we did know our expiry date, um, life would be boring anyway. So the mystery keeps me going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mystery of life. Will it yeah. end or will it not? Ooh, okay. Uh, what will happen after? Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> True. Um, so how do you define religion and spirituality? 
I think, oh, religion is, um, I think both, you know, it's a belief system. I mean, it is a belief system. Some people have voids in their life and, and they need a more like maybe a format, a place to go to worship. Mm -hmm. um, spirituality is more a relationship between you and the universe. And it's about the vibration and the frequency. And I believe in the quantum fields. I believe this is a field and we are um in 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 these multi-dimensional um you know places and it's yeah that's my belief system but it might not be everyone's but i'm happy on this field to be honest we may yeah yeah exactly <laughs> exactly exactly love it um what's the lesson that took you the longest to learn being myself mm being authentic yeah took a bloody long time yeah yeah <laughs> and and to be honest with you without being authentic I can't act so I have to know who I am before I can add more characters and other layers on top of me so I've had to de-layer and and decompress from everything from the past um in order to be present and then take on other personalities mm. Oh, that makes sense. Because if you're not, if you don't have that foundation of authentic you, you could get lost in the roles that you play. Absolutely. Mm. Hence why the meditation helps me to be grounded and, and to feel right. Now I'm ready to take on another personality because that's a lot of work. Mm. Um, mm. So um, Yasmin is parked and now... Sophia is arriving for instance you know <laughs> yeah amazing oh I love that I love that do you believe that people with horrible beginnings end up creating the best futures I really hope so I really hope everyone makes it and breaks it and and gets through the process um and and yeah if it is possible. I think there is a bit of bravery and resilience required. And everyone, we all have it with, within us, in our system, you know, in our belief system, in our, the way in our nature, we have it in us. And I think it's just tapping into it, being able to tap into that. Mm, beautifully said. Um, I am fully in present moment when? um when i'm doing stand-up comedy oh <laughs> you gotta be there right <laughs> amazing i love it i love it i love it um <laughs> do you believe there is an end to healing no mm -hmm. it continues mm -hmm. <laughs> the world needs more of what pain and pleasure because pain. we're here to experience both PP. Mm. Wow, that's that's a good one. That's a really good one. Um, the cuff. It's all off the cuff. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, amazing. Um, so what is that one message you would like to share with someone who's going through hard times, who's going through a spiritual awakening and go and is in uh, experiencing dark night the soul? Mm -hmm. What would you say to them? Stay there. Stay mm -hmm. there, darling the magic is due to arrive because the more pain you experience in the process, the more excitement will come in the future. So just stay there, stay wherever you are and just keep doing the work. When I say stay there, I mean, go through those levels of stages. Um, It's going to be so exciting. <laughs> oh, wow. That's great. I love it. I love it. What a message. Thank you, Jasmine, for coming on this podcast. Thank Thanks you so much. for having me. What a gorgeous pleasure that was. Yeah, I mean, it's a great conversation. I hope so, um, some of our listeners might take away some of your survival toolkit as well and acting and there may be so, so many people who are in this uh, part of the world and they may take the wisdom and knowledge from you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. I really appreciate it.
Yes, pleasure. Thank you for listening to this episode. I would absolutely love to know what your biggest takeaway from this conversation has been. You can share your thoughts on my Facebook or Instagram, Madhya Sosen. If you would like to listen to this episode, I am on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and many, many more. Just search Soul Awakenings with Madhya Sosen. If you enjoyed this episode, then please do rate and share this with your family and friends as that will help me out a lot. Thank you so much once again and I will see you in the next episode.